Welcome to the Lean Blog Podcast. Visit our website at www.leanblog.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Graben. Hi, this is Mark Graben from the Lean Blog. Today is November 26, 2006. This is episode number 11 of the Lean Blog Podcast. Uh, my guest again today is Norman Bodek from PCS Press. He's been joining uh, about monthly on the podcast. And our topic today is the same topic we talked about last time with Jamie Flinchbaugh. It was a question that came in from a podcast listener, Bruce in Akron. And Norman is going to tackle that question of how do you um, educate your top leadership within your company? Um, Norman will talk about a number of topics, including uh, perspectives from uh, the CEO and the executive level and some interesting insights there. It is kind of a long podcast. It's running uh, in about 40 minutes. But as always, there are some detailed show notes. If you go to uh, the webpage on the blog for this podcast, or if you go to leanpodcast.org, you'll see a list of episodes. And there are uh, pretty detailed notes with topics and approximate time. So if you want to jump around and um, go to a specific topic, that's one good way of doing that. But I hope you enjoy the podcast and hope you will continue to join us here. Thank you. Well, Norman, thanks again for joining us on the Lean Blood Podcast. As always, it's nice to have you here with us. Very nice to be here. Thank you, Mark, for inviting me. Norman, we're going to start this podcast um, as we started the last one with Jamie Flinchbaugh with uh, an excellent and thought-provoking question that came in uh, from a podcast listener via the Skype phone service. Yeah, Mark, my name is Bruce, and I'm from Akron, Ohio, and yeah, I'm a fan of the Lean of your Lean podcast. And one of the things that you know in our organization we struggle with is sometimes kind of educating up, up the up the org- up the organization to to our leadership who don't maybe they don't really understand what they're asking us to do, if that makes sense. They kind of think lean is maybe about reducing headcount or it's about 5S maybe. Um, so th- that would be interesting. It would be interesting to hear, you know, Jamie and Norman or people like that talk about some experiences there. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye-bye. This is a very appropriate and wonderful question, Mark. You know, I, I keynoted the Lean Accounting Summit a few weeks ago in Orlando, Florida. And the room was filled with maybe 500 CFOs and controllers of large corporations. And um, I spoke to a lot of them, and almost every single one that I spoke to was complaining about the same kind of question. How do they get their boss to do it? How do they get their boss to lead this, this lean effort? As mm-hmm. if they were, even at their level, which is very high at the corporation, that right. they felt powerless to to really get things done. Um, funny. And this is as the CFO who's, who's sitting there right next to or just below the CEO. Right, yeah. and, and still feels he has to get, he has to get permission. <laughs> hmm. We all have to get permission. I like the old saying, you know, it's better to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask <laughs> for permission. Right. Because 90% of the time when you ask somebody, right, something new, they're going to say no. That's the, the common response. Because if I say yes, there's a little bit of danger in saying yes, especially if I'm, I'm going out on the limb of something that I'm not really comfortable with. This sure. is true at every level. I remember when I went to Japan with the president of AFCO Corporation. AFCO at the time was an independent $2 billion corporation, and they eventually got bought out by... Um, I don't remember the name of this military contractor. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the time, I went over with John Farrar, and we, we took about 20 of their senior managers, all of their division presidents went with us. We went to Japan to study Japanese management practices. It was a very nice trip, a nice flight, because we all flew first class, and mm-hmm. I sat next to Don Farrar, the president, and on the way over, he said to me, Norman, how can I get my people? to deliver quality. How can I get quality from them? Mm-hmm. We're having trouble in our plant with quality. In fact, at the time, one of their divisions made tanks for the M1. Uh, they made engines for mm-hmm. the M1 tanks. Yeah, so the was stuff. Easy, And the engine was breaking down all the time. And so what can we do to get quality? Um, after two weeks in Japan, coming back on the airplane, I happened to sit next to him again. And he said, Norman, now I understand. It's not them, it's me. Mm. I, I love that awareness just by going and visiting with the Japanese and why it's important to go on these study missions, on these benchmarking trips, mm-hmm. especially going to Japan. Well, at the time, 
AFCO hired me as a consultant. This was very funny, very interesting. A senior vice president by the name of Jack Tatchen, he called the American Productivity and Quality Center in Houston, Texas, Mm -hmm. and asked the chairman there, I need a consultant. And very strangely, and I don't know why, but he said, you know, Norman Bodick is right in your same town. Why don't you call him? Right. And he did. Called me, they brought me in and interviewed me and asked me if I would be willing to come maybe one day a month and to teach him what quality and productivity is all about. Mm-hmm. I said it would be a pleasure. But one of the first things we decided to do when I went to him was, this was so powerful, so simple, and so wonderful. We decided we were going to ask all of the division presidents, and there was about 12 of them, to write their annual plans of how they were going to improve quality and productivity. This was, this was really great. Instead of telling these people what to do at this level, we asked them, mm-hmm. what are you going to do to deliver higher quality and higher productivity? And he said to them the following. Don, Don was the president of the company. Mm-hmm. He says, Don has asked me to get from you this productivity and quality plan and I want it by, and we, and we want it by October 31st, giving them about three and a half weeks to do hmm. it. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure these presidents were so happy because that was a lot of pressure on them sure. to get it done. But every single one of them complied and we received, um, very divergent plans from each of the presidents. Now, before I lead on to the result of this, um, what what Jack Katzen did is he wrote to the division president with the power of the president. He didn't ask Don, Don, could I go ahead and do this? No. Yeah. That's not the way he operated. He said to each of these presidents, Don has asked me to do this. Of course, he sent a copy of that letter to Don. Don was not going to say no. Mm-hmm. This is typical of the CEOs of major corporations, right? They, they run companies through consultants by being <laughs> told what to do. Right. <laughs> Very funny. How they got there, that's another story. But so the people out there knew that if Don was asking for something, they had to deliver. He's the president. Right. And so Jack used the power of the president. He didn't have to ask Don, is this okay? I want to send this out. This is what I want to do. No. He put these letters together. He said, Don, this is what we're going to do if we're going to get quality and productivity. The letters went out, and we received, before the end of the month, 12 plans from each of the uh, presidents. They were big, mm-hmm. big, big company. One, were, one of them was a very large life insurance company. AFCO also owned, like Household Finance, they had 1,200, at least 1,200 uh, finance stores around the around the country where they lent people money. Right. So. And they made wings for Boeing aircrafts, etc. So, well So so what did these plans I'll, in, in, I'll just finish the yeah. story. Yeah. Go ahead. So I was gonna ask what these plans included. What was it elements of you know that we're we're gonna use lean um, improvement methods or, or did they get all wide range of different answers about how they were gonna drive quality? It was a wide range because at that time almost nobody knew about lean. Yeah. And they only had a smattering of information on what Japan was doing in quality. But they're very bright people. They led these, these very big companies. And they submitted, in their knowledge base, very excellent plan. Each of them said excellent plan. But what we did, which was so wonderful, is we took all 12, and we made copies of all 12. Mm-hmm. We made copies of all 12 for all 12, so that every president received, division president, received back 12 plans, received the plan of all of their peers within the corporation. Mm -hmm. And then Jack said the following, you know, Don has asked me to have you look at the plans from each of the divisions, and based upon common knowledge, I want you to rewrite your plan and come back with a new plan. Mm. Beautiful. We received back a 12 wonderful plans. They were able to gather the strength from each other, but remember, these were all separate all separate companies and separate industries, mm-hmm, right. all different. Some of them in customer service, you know, some of them 
totally different. Well, four years later, Jack becomes the uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense, and he invites me down to the Pentagon. And at the Pentagon, there was a room filled with people to meet me. And he said to them, in fact, the room was filled maybe a dozen generals, mm. an admiral, yeah. and an Assistant Secretary of Defense. The only one who really wasn't there was the Secretary of Defense himself. This was funny, because then Jack gets up, and I want you to meet Norman Bodek. And I want you to meet the man that saved my company after $400 million. I loved that moment, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, and what did we do? We primarily took this group to Japan. We let them visit, learn what the Japanese were doing. And we had them set at least an annual plan. Now, I like what the Japanese do, by the way is they start off maybe with 100 years, and then 50 years, then 25 years, then 10 years, and then they do their best to make a really great five-year plan. So you're saying they, right? they make really long-term, uh, these are these strategic plans as far as what types of businesses they're going to be in, or what they, are they, are they financially yeah, driven plans, much- or... Well, if you go 100 years out, it's not too detailed. Right, right. Except, except that reminds me the president, the recent president, Toyota, said last year, I'd love us, Toyota, to make a car that's going to go from the west coast of America to the east coast of America on one tank of gasoline. So there's a long-term vision. And they've also talked about that's building what, cars that, that don't pollute either, which is a very long-term that don't goal. Pollute. Sure, you see. Yeah. So if you're if you're a little bit concrete, you might say, you know, within within ten years we'll have unpolluted cars of twenty five years. One company that I did some research on was um let's see, this is the company that makes uh lingerie. Noriko, which is the top lingerie company in Japan? Wako, thank you, Wako. <laughs> 25 or 50 years ago, Wako said, um, we want to be, our 50-year plan is to be the world's leader producing the finest uh, women's lingerie mm-hmm. in the world. And so they started off with a five-year plan and a 10-year plan, mainly in 10-year segments. Of First, we were going to establish our business in Japan in the lingerie business. Then the next 10 years is we were going to be noted as one of the finest. In the next 10, we were going to be the top lingerie company in Japan. In the next 10 years, we're going to start penetrating the world market with our with our products. And in the last 10 years, we will be the number one lingerie company in the world, bar none. Yeah, that's the kind of thing, is to set this kind of vision... Mm-hmm. And then go for it. Right. So, now, well, I mean, back back to Bruce's question about, you know, what what can we do with our companies and and leadership? I mean, if we work for a big public company, you know, companies are, are notorious for um, not being able to look beyond the quarter. Um, you know, looking at this quarter's numbers and what are we going to do this year and what are we going to do with our stock price? Um, I mean, how, how, is there? I mean, what what can we do as far as um, you know to to get Leaders to, to look at the yeah. long term or, or to look I'll at leadership. Should we buy a lot of copies of uh, some lean books and have them sent to uh, well, the executive they should office? Well, of course, <laughs> they should all buy my Kai Kako book. Of course. Yeah. Everybody should read my book. But two things two things come up when you say this. Yeah. One is this question has been burning in me the last couple of weeks, which is if not me, then who? I like that very much. Yeah. It's just been burning in me. And if not me, then who? Right? Who's going to take responsibility if I don't? Why do we keep passing the buck to someone else? The other thing I like about the Japanese management system that's made them so successful is we call it bottoms-up management. This will lead us into our next topic, which is how do we empower people? Sure. The bottoms-up management idea. If we truly want to run a company, then we give power to the people that have the best information. So, if this middle manager who's asking this question really has good information, right, Mm -hmm. then they have to go ahead and do it. That's why I say it's better to ask for forgiveness than ask for permission. Don't ask for permission. You're paid a good salary for where you are. You do it. Stop living with fear. 
You know? So, I mean, we're always we, afraid to make a mistake. Well, is, is your advice yeah. then, I mean, to, to move forward, you know, the best you can within your span of control? And, I mean, sure, there's a risk that you, you make a lot of improvements and somebody up above says, okay, well, great, we're going to take productivity gains by you laying off 200 people. I mean, I mean, sure, I guess, you know, there's a risk of that well, happening, but are, things, are you yeah. saying we shouldn't live in fear of that, even if that's a possibility? It's a possibility, but I don't think we have, if we, if we get the right systems going, that won't happen. Um, I am saying that people should operate at the level they're on with the level of responsibility that they have that they are the boss. So they're, they're the boss of their span of control. Mm-hmm. If I'm running a division, if I'm running a department store for the company, then of course they have certain procedures I have to follow. I have to buy certain products that conform to their image, but I'm the boss in how I run this business, and I don't have to ask my boss for permission. It's as if my boss is smarter than me. Well, that's not true. He might be smarter in certain things that he knows more about the finance of the company than I do. Yeah. Well, I should make all the decisions necessary, right? And, and then I develop a plan. I can send a copy to the boss to say, this is what I'm going to do to attain the goals that you want from us. Right. The next thing you mentioned about the boss who says we're going to lay off 200 people. I like what Jim Schwartz did once. Jim was the one of the leaders of Delco Rini, Delco Rini made the division of General Motors that made radios, batteries, I think. Radios, anyway. I think both. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, he, he had about a thousand people working for him. And his boss came and said, you know, I want you to lay off uh, so many people. I want to send the work to China, to Hong Kong. Right. And Jim's immediate reaction was, um, why don't you tell me what you want? Do you want people, you want jobs to go to to Hong Kong, or do you want to reduce the cost so much? Well, the boss says, I want to reduce the cost 15%. Right. And so Jack said, okay, I'll get you 15% cost. Let's leave it at that. And he gave him a 15% reduction without laying anybody off right. and without right. sending any right. work to China. You see? If we get the boss to, to give us the specific goals of what they want, many bosses just say, go to China, go to the Philippines. The reason they say that is that's the vogue today. You know, that's the bandwagon. Everybody's going on the China, right. going on the China bandwagon, which believe me is not so smart. Yeah. It seems like that, that's a bandwagon we all jumped on easier than the lean bandwagon or, you know. Oh you know, yeah. And, and you hear, 30 you know, an hour. people have problems, uh, you know, there, there's, I hear reports from people, um, you know, that China's not the low cost country anymore, that, you know, labor prices are rising, not to mention the, the supply chain costs and, you know, lack of responsiveness. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to see if the pendulum swings back to where, you know, are, are we going to just chase the next low-cost country where, you know, people mention Vietnam and, you know, other countries like that. You know, if there's always well, somebody I, cheaper I or will we start, you know, will we rely on lean more? I think what's going to happen if we continue in this direction that we better learn Chinese because we're going to be working for Chinese forces. I mean, we're outsourcing almost everything. But and once you outsource to the Chinese, they're going to learn. I like to tell the story about Schwinn Bicycle, you know, because right. they went to Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan they went to, and they outsourced the, one of the first. This one was a really known company in America, and they outsourced to a company called Giant. And Giant was so smart, first it was cheap labor, then Giant did everything. They made the molds. They said, look, we've got engineering. You want a tenth what you pay for American engineering. After 10, 15 years, the contract was over. Giant said to Schwinn, we don't need you anymore. Yeah. We can market our bikes. And I see those bikes in the stores, yeah. Sure, and if you looked at the Tour de France on television, you would have seen Giant, one of the companies leading the tour, and there was no Schwinn bike in the, yeah. in the Tour de France, you know. So let's switch now. So what I'm really saying to these people, you're paid to be a boss. You be the boss. You know, be willing to make a mistake. And you make the decision and inform the boss what has to be informed on. But don't ask for permission. You do it. Yeah. Say, this is what I'm going and, to do. You've given me the responsibility to lead this. Yeah. And, and one other takeaway I guess I have from this, the discussion on this, you know, back to your comment of, you know, the, the CEO asking, you know, how do I get my people to do it? You know, that they feel, you know, I guess we as employees, you know, look up to the executive leadership and expect them to be kind of, you know, all powerful, and you know, if you were only the CEO, you could do what you wanted. 
Um, and we, yes. we point fingers in that direction, and it sounds like, you know, they point fingers, and, and, and somehow we end up, you know, talking past each other, or, you know, blaming past each other uh, okay. instead of actually fixing it. Communication, Mark, is another issue that we should cover on one of these future podcasts. Yeah. How do we break down the barriers of communication? Well, the next thing that you mentioned, which I like very much, is this whole issue of empowerment. Because Toyota has these two pillars. 99% of what we've been talking about and doing is just the pillar called Just in Time or Lean or the Toyota Production System or the Elimination of Waste. Yeah. That's where all the effort is. Value stream mapping, we're looking to get rid of the waste. Cut inventory and cut time yeah, and cut, cut costs. Yes. Yeah. But there's an eight new waste that I call, you know, the waste of human talent. Right. The unutilized talent of people. And that's the one that will offer us the greatest opportunity. I mean, we go to China for 30 cents or 50 cents an hour before we've set our factory into cells. Before we've, you know what I mean, before we've understood how to free up people from machines so that one person can run 10 machines instead of one machine. Right. So here we have 10 people running 10 machines, right? We're going to... Go to China to save 30 cents an hour instead of reorganizing the plant where you have one worker running 10 machines. You don't have to go to China. Then we understand how Toyota is able to come to America to make cars. <laughs> right. They come here and we go there. Kind of crazy. Let's go into this second pillar of Toyota, which is respect for people. And the heart of respect for people is in the number of things. One is developing people. Developing people, skills, and capabilities. Mm-hmm. And the other basis is how do we open up the creative level of these people? And what do we mean by empowerment? A lot of it's in vogue today. If you look at the vision mission statements of many companies, they want to empower people. But very few people know how to empower people. I'll give you an example. I'm working with one company, and I taught about 500 of their employees on this. Uh, creative approach that I like very much. I call it the easy kind right. because it's so easy to do. Um, and in the class that I'm running, a number of the employees, not just, but a number of the employees complain about management taking away their fans. Now, it's hot in the summer in some of these mm-hmm. plants. And they didn't like the idea that the fans were taken away from them. It was a real gripe. What can they do? Yeah. They don't have the power. Now, if we have an environment where we want people to be empowered, what would you do, Mark? Well, I, 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 th- th- if, I think, yeah, you would, you would give people a budget to manage and, you know, maybe you know, spend that on, on the ways they thought were going to best improve the work environment so that they could be comfortable and that they would have that distraction removed and they could produce quality. Yeah, you're getting close, but you're ahead of the game. Let's backtrack. Okay. Oh, actually, I, I want to add in, ed- too. A lot they're not that educated yet. <laughs> what? No, I was just going to add in a lot of people, and maybe you're going to address this, too, that people would say, well, you know, if I – let people do whatever they want, then they're not going to work. And, you know, I think, that, you know, there's this mindset. Yeah, yeah, no, we're not going to that extreme. Yeah. That, that's what always people do. They rush to the extreme to allow them to knock it to say it's not a good idea. <laughs> right, right. We always do that. Well, I love the, the, this approach, the strategic approach or the Hoshan approach, is we'll stretch this out maybe over five years, and we'll look and we'll set up maybe five steps. Where we, Where are we now? And where do we want to go? What's the ultimate in empowerment? Well, the ultimate empowerment to me is everybody is their own boss. And they're making all the decisions that relate to the work around them, you know, and they don't need a boss because they're the boss. It's like the idea that I'm a carpenter. I know how to make a chair. A customer comes to me, tells you what they want, and I make the chair. I don't need the supervisor's advice. I have 10 years of, right. of, of skill, you know, on making beautiful chairs. Yeah. I've demonstrated my ability. So, in this area of the fan, I recommend that we start off by saying to a group of workers, okay, I don't like fans. And the reason I don't like fans, being the boss, 
is it blows dust into the equipment. Mm. And we we make medical equipment. How can we deliver, you know, dirt and grime in medical equipment? Right. Okay. So you find out there's, a, re- the there's a reason behind it. It's not just that the boss is mean, right? Right. <laughs> it's still, it's, you know, I'm not going to say that. Yes, there is a reason behind it. So now we turn to the workers and we say to them, look, this is the situation. You want fans, but I don't want dirt in my machines. Customer doesn't want dirt in my machines. I want you to get to group, get together in small groups. You sign maybe three people. I like, I like three people groups, by the way. And you set up one or maybe three of them to have them get together. But I want you to study on a real basis. I want you to go to the internet. I want you to study, you know, all about what the fans are doing. I want you to come back and tell me what are the problems with fans and then is there a way around this? Uh-huh. Then the people can study, and they look at it from their view, and also from the company's view, and they see, you know, what is the root cause? We really want to get to the root cause of the problem. Instead of the course making an arbitrary decision, what's the root cause, right? Well, the root effect is that there's dust. Then what's the what's the cause of the dust? Now maybe we could eliminate the dust, and if we eliminate the dust. We don't have to eliminate. Right. So we start asking why and keep we keep going keep in that direction. The then? Yeah. Yes, we keep yeah. every time there's a decision to be made. Can the decision be made by? I just got bowled out today. I'm a consultant for a company here in town, and I noticed a number of problems that they had uh, creating defects, mm-hmm. and immediately came to me what to do. To eliminate those defects. And I told the worker what to do. And the president of the company said, Norman, that's not what you're here for. <laughs> you're here to make them problem solvers. Right. Yes, and this is the essence of the Toyota style that I just forget too often. <laughs> Ono would never tell. Yeah. Only ask. Never ask. Never tell. Only ask. Yeah. But I mean, I think so many of us yeah. are brought up in a business environment where, you know, the boss is expected to have the answers. And if you're not Telling people what to do, then, you know, people ask, well, you know, what is that, what is that leader here for if they're not telling people what to do? And I, and I understand true. how, that, that, I understand yes. how that causes problems, but that's a hard habit to break of, I mean, of course it cause is. I mean, you talk about empowering people, but then I think, isn't it true? A lot of people are afraid of if I'm giving power to employees, I'm there, therefore losing it, that it's a zero sum game, yes. a limited amount of power yes. to be had, right? You're absolutely right, Mark. Of course, we think it's a zero-sum game, but but we we use just the wrong analogy. Best analogy is to look at a football team today, and the football team or the baseball team, you know, it's the players that are the stars. But the boss, the manager, is a coach. He has a really important, fundamental position of what he's there for to give guidance of where we're going with this product. Yeah. Right. What do our customers want? Our customers want us to win this ball game. And so I've studied the strategies. I've studied, you know, I've studied the other team very carefully, and I know what their weaknesses are, and I try to develop the approach that the stars can do their best job. Right. That's the same thing in the company. How do we train people to give them the skills and the capabilities, right, so that they can make the right decisions? But look, it works this way, too. Let's take the fan situation. The workers do their homework, and they determine that the real problem is the dust, and that we have a method that we can eliminate this dust, really eliminate it. Even though dust comes down every day, we can get a handle on this dust. We can all wear white jackets, Mm -hmm. as an example. Why do they wear white jackets in clean rooms, right? Because you can detect dust from dirt very quickly and very easily, Mm -hmm. right? And um, they're coming back to you with their decision. Then you're the boss. The best thing you do at that moment is take a deep breath mm-hmm. and not react right away. Because there are people that are wonderful in playing devil's advocates, and they always mm-hmm. have something that they can, some weakness, you know. Right. And the trick of a good manager is you take a deep breath, mm-hmm. deep, deep, deep breath. Deep breath, and you look at what's been what's been developed by the people. And you say to yourself, how do you find a way of accepting what they've done? 
Yeah, I was just bawled out this morning because he was telling me that there's always these things that scatter out there. But look at the 90%. Look at the heart of what's right and try to strengthen and develop that. Yeah. It's not easy shifting, Mark, from being this boss, carrot and stick approach, you know, and follow me because I'm the smartest, to the approach where I want to really empower you. Right. Now, you see... By empowering the worker doesn't mean that the boss, the manager, is giving away their power. They always make the ultimate decision which is better for the company. But isn't it so much better that the people come back and they make the decision for you? Right. Because if it's done right, 95% of the time, those people out there are going to find the best way for you. And then you're supporting them. Yeah. And look at the way they feel. When you've given them that trust yeah. and respect well, to do that kind of thing. Let, let me ask one question back to um, your, your notion. You talk about people building chairs, and you know if people are empowered, that you know, everybody can be their own boss. But you know, you look at Toyota, and they, and they still have um, quite a hierarchy, uh, you know, and a structure within their within their factories. And you know, a lot of people, you know, we've talked about how they fill a different role um, than traditional managers might. And you know, it, it is part of the risk or part of the reason managers are in place that if everybody is being their own boss, that you run the risk of you know suboptimizing things, or if you know, if I only know this part of the factory, I can only make decisions that are the best for that portion. That it's, and I think you were saying some of this, that it's the boss's role to, to have a wider, broader view so that they can make sure that they can guide individual decisions to, to all fit together. Is that one way of saying it maybe? Well, no, not really. You, not even guide because you really want to stay back so they make the right decision for you. This is funny, you know, because you call a company, they almost any company, and you speak to the first person who picks up the phone, and most of the time they're powerless. Mm -hmm. And they're very defensive. They defend, wow, I mean, just this couple of days ago, came back from my trip in Mexico, and I lost a credit card about three, four weeks ago, and the company replaced it and gave me a new one, and now I'm traveling. And I use the card extensively, and they try to get in touch with me, but they couldn't. I'm in Mexico yeah. somewhere. And so they didn't pay some of the credit card bills, which is very embarrassing mm -hmm. for me, right? Mm -hmm. And I've been with this credit card company for 15 years. I run up tens of thousands of expenses a month. And for $500, they wouldn't pay. Mm -hmm. And so I called up, and I was quite furious. And they're immediately defending Chase Manhattan mm -hmm. Bank, Chase Credit Card. Yeah. They're defending the, the company because they're a fraud out there, right? Instead of the simple principle is the customer is always right. And you start from that premise and you just say to the customer, look, you're absolutely right. We will do our best to correct the system. That's a nice well, A lot of times people hide behind rules and, so, and policies and I'm not able to. And You see what they're not doing, because I had asked for the supervisor in this case too. Huh. We're not communicating properly. Yeah. I mean, if I call anywhere you go, Mark, you ask people to describe to you their problem on their line. I asked the steward, can you tell me what's in the lunch? She doesn't know what's in the lunch. I react to so many foods, I want to know what's in the lunch. She doesn't know. <laughs> if you call someone in Japan, anywhere, you can talk to any worker, and they will be able to tell you almost everything, because they so thoroughly communicate with each other, and their knowledge of the product Disappears. So, so the, what is the boss? Yes. No, sorry, man. So, I, you know, I was saying, you, you were kind of correcting me that it's not the boss's role to try to guide people, but is it, is it more accurate to say it's the boss's job to help educate people so that, in, you know, if I'm that chair maker, I do have a broader view so that that, that I can make less suboptimizing decisions. Can, you know, communication, yes, education. Has, yeah. Well, I guess the That's ultimate, the, the, the ultimate, uh, I guess the opposite of. Empowerment, you know, I've, I've seen this in, in some workplaces a long time ago where the bosses hold on to their power by, you know, keeping hold of all the information. And so oh, I, I guess I can and see I work where... for men like that. Of course. And I, I work for, there are people out there that, that do want to stay the boss by being better than you. They're always competing with you instead of recognizing their job is to develop you. Yeah. That's another part oh. of this point we're going to talk about is we'll do this next time is how Toyota goes, goes out goes their way to develop their people. Yes. The boss 
can make the decision through the people. His role is to educate them, to coach them, to give them the vision, to give them the direction, and to be an arbiter if that's necessary when there's confrontation or, you know, diverse opinions that come back from the people on how to do things. Yeah. Oh no, would just look out at, like I always use this example. He looks at the warehouse, but he was chairman of Toyota Bosin. And he said, you know, Toyota, we don't need warehouse. Hmm. So get rid of the warehouse. He says, I'll give you one year. I want everybody in the warehouse to be retrained as a mechanic. <laughs> and I'll come back. Yeah. Make this into a machine shop. And he left. He didn't tell them what to do. He didn't tell them how to do it. Everybody knew. Shingo taught the same way. Shingo would come yeah. in, recognize a problem, uh, uh, a waste that existed, and he would say to them, okay, what do you have to do to get this done? You need 30 days? I'll come back in 30 days. And you do it. Yeah. And leave. Well, and it's good that Ono had the foresight not to say, get rid of the warehouse, we're going to lay everybody off. But there was at least some plan, you know, come up with a more productive way of uh, making use of people, yeah. giving them something uh, where they can create more value. Yes. How could Toyota uh, not lay off a single person in 56 years from General Motors is laying off 50,000? And the irony of this, Mark, is that Ono, to me, if he doesn't get too mad at me, was totally ruthless. Yeah. Totally. And how does the most ruthless individual <laughs> to drive this just-in-time system end up with the most humanistic management system on the globe today? Isn't this amazing? Yeah, it's quite a conflict yeah. it would seem, yeah. Toyota opened a plant in Texas this year. They wanted less than 2,000 people, 115,000 people applied for the job. Yeah. They must be doing something. I, right. I know, and when Mark, you, you hear people say, I guess my, one last point to that, you know, you hear a lot of people that like to gripe about how, you know, lean is mean and that, you know, uh, you know, Toyota factories work people to death and they never let you take a break. But boy, if it was that bad of an environment, you think the word would have gotten around by now and they wouldn't have so many people applying. Of course. Yeah. It's a solution. But people working for Toyota paid very well. They have good medical plans and they get a lot. They get more breaks. Some working with companies, they give 10 minute breaks. You know, they give 20 minutes for lunch. You don't, I'm sure you get at least 30 minutes for lunch at Toyota. <laughs> Hey, I think this is wonderful, Mark. I enjoy doing this with you. I hope to do it again with you real soon. And I, I appreciate that, and I would certainly invite more of our listeners. You know, if they have questions for Norman, uh, you know, they can either email, like some people have done, or um, like our guest today, you can send me a message through uh, the Skype phone service. There's more information about how to do that out on uh, the Lean Blog website. So hopefully we'll get more of that Thank interaction and, and feed those questions to you, Norman. Thank you very much, Mark. And make sure you mention the name of the person who asked that great question. Uh, Absolutely well. Thanks. Thanks for listening. This has been the Lean Blog Podcast. For lean news and commentary updated daily, visit www.leanblog.org. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast, email mark at leanpodcast at gmail.com.